Our scripture reading today comes to us from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the date the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. This is the word of God for all people. So, last week, I talked about whether or not God has a plan for your life. Detailed plan. And looking throughout Scripture, it becomes pretty clear through the preponderance of Scripture that God does not have a detailed plan for your life, but that God has a purpose for you within his plan for the universe. And you have a role to play in God's plan. But first, before we get into this week's sermon, I'm going to say a couple notes about last week. First, first some people were a little upset when I made the comment, we are not that special. So let me back up and explain a little bit more what I meant by that. First of all, you are unique. And you are beloved of God. And when Jesus hung on the cross, he actually thought about each of you as he was dying. Because Jesus came to die for you. Because you are special, unique and important to God. And because you are special to God, God has given you a role. He has a special, unique purpose in his redemptive plan for the universe for you. Because you are special to God. Now when I said you're not that special, what I was referring to is the fact that in Israel, there was over a million inhabitants. And each of the million inhabitants was important to Israel and important to the building up of that kingdom. But there was only one David. Each Israelite was important to God. But there was only one David who got specific instructions. And when Israel was wandering in the desert, there are a hundred thousand Israelites. And each Israelite is of vital importance to see the community through the wilderness into the promised land. But there was only one Moses. We may each want to be Moses or David, but we're not. And each Israelite is beloved by God and has an important role to play in that kingdom. And so when I said we're not that special, I meant we're not probably Moses or David. That doesn't mean we are not incredibly special and important and beloved by God. And God loves us so much, and you are so special to God, that he gives you a unique and important role to play in his plan to redeem the universe. And God does have a purpose for you. And God loves you so much that he gives you this purpose. And God gives you the free will to live out that purpose. God doesn't micromanage. In fact, just something to think about if, you're, if you absolutely have to have a detailed plan. How many of you received a memo with a really detailed plan from God for your life? Nobody received that memo. Which then leaves us with two choices. Either A, God has a really detailed plan for, actually three choices. God has a really detailed plan for your life, and he's not telling you. In which case, you're going to mess up that plan, and God's going to be really upset that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And then God's just a big need. Or option two is, God has a detailed plan for your life, and he's forcing you to live it even without you knowing it. 
In which case, you're just a puppet, and God's pulling strings and controlling you, and you have no free will. And we know God calls us through Scripture to freely come to Him, to freely worship Him. And if we don't have the ability to choose, we cannot freely come to Him and freely worship. It's not free if He's forcing it. Which leaves us only with the third choice, that God gives us the freedom to live out His purpose, our role in His kingdom. And then like a loving parent, God is there to, to offer us help if we ask for it, to provide us with the gifts that we need to live out that purpose. He is there to support us in any way we need, while giving us that freedom. Now, most of us have not actually heard God's voice. I'm assuming most of you have probably not actually heard God ever speak to you audibly. You're in a room and suddenly a voice booms out and says, do this. I know I only have one real close friend who's ever actually heard God's voice. And it was a really active member at a previous church that I served and who stayed a really good friend of mine. Uh, and he was much younger, 30 years ago. And his wife was in a serious automobile accident. And he did not believe in God. And she is still crippled to this day from that accident. But right after the accident, she was taken. They did emergency surgery. They put her in intensive care. It was touch and go whether she was going to survive. And after two days in intensive care, she was declining. So they had to pull her back into emergency surgery. And he was in the waiting room, waiting for his wife, wondering if she was going to live or die. They were a young couple just starting out. He had just graduated from law school and had gotten a really good job. She was a, just gotten a job as a librarian in the new town they just moved to. And, and she was coming home from a Bible study. And he didn't even believe in God, but he let her go to a Bible study because she believed in God. And he found himself in this waiting room all by himself in the middle of the night while they're doing this emergency surgery on his wife. And he said he just got so angry and frustrated and, and upset that he just started yelling out, Why? 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 And he said, as he was yelling out, all of a sudden he heard this voice, as clear as someone was standing in the room with him, saying, who are you yelling at? And he said, wow. All of a sudden I realized, I believe in God. Because who else was I yelling at? And he said, hearing that voice, just asking that question, made him realize that God was real. And he said he committed himself to serve God at that moment. A few days later, he committed himself to Jesus Christ. But he began to pray. And that prayer, he's convinced, helped heal his wife. And he has been a devoted Christian, one of the most active people in the church in serving Jesus Christ since that time. He hasn't heard from God again. It's not like God's giving him daily memos saying, do this. But he has been serving how God is leading. Now, most of us don't even hear God speak that much. So how do we know what God wants us to do? How do we know what our purpose in God's kingdom is? And I have a number of people who ask, how do I, you know, what is God's plan for me? What is God's purpose for me? How do I know what God's purpose for me is? Or others who ask, why doesn't God talk to us more anymore? Why don't I hear from God? <coughs> so hopefully we're going to try and answer some of those questions this morning. So to figure out what our purpose with God is, we're going to start at the beginning of the book of Acts with Jesus. And Jesus gathers all of his followers together, not just the 12 apostles, but all of his followers. So everyone who believes in Jesus, who's committed to him in faith throughout Israel, gathers there on the mountain outside of, outside of Jerusalem. They're at the top of the Mount of Olives. And there, Jesus speaks to them. And he tells them, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you guys. And when that happens, you all, you notice he doesn't just say to his disciples, apostles, the apostles are going to be my witnesses. He says, you all, everyone, every one of my followers is going to be a witness for me. And this is a message he gives to every single person who proclaims faith in Jesus Christ, which I assume is everybody in this room. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, come talk to me after the service and 
and we'll chat. But provided you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this passage speaks to you. We are all called to be witnesses. Now, when we think of a witness, we think of someone in a courtroom who's standing up to give testimony of what they've seen or what they know. And most of us, at least I know I, have not actually seen Jesus. Back then, you had the disciples, and they actually had seen Jesus. They knew him. So they could go and testify what they had seen, and that they had seen him rise, raise, rise from the dead. We can't testify that because we haven't actually seen him, right? Has anyone seen Jesus? Yeah. But what I have seen, and what I have experienced, is God's love warming my heart. What I have experienced is God's love changing other people's lives. What I have experienced is God's grace in my own life and in the lives of others. And what I have witnessed is the truth of God's word in my life and others. And so I am called, we are all called to witness to the love, the grace, and the truth that we find in Jesus Christ. Paul calls us ambassadors. And an ambassador is someone who's, whose real residence is somewhere else, in a different country, a different place is his citizenship, but he's gone to a strange place of alien people to witness and talk about and represent his true home. And we're called to do that, to be witnesses to a greater truth, to a greater love, to a greater grace that exists in God's kingdom. And we're here to do that. Now that's pretty basic. But how are we to witness? That's where it gets a little more difficult. Because everyone has a different calling as to how we're called to witness. No two people are called to witness the same. But we're all still called. We all still have a role to play, a purpose to fulfill as a witness. You look at the, the disciples and all Jesus' followers throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Every one of them, every one of his followers is a witness to Christ's love, but they all do it differently. Some start a little Bible study in their home. Some go across the seas to go witness in foreign lands. Some stay in Jerusalem to tend to the kingdom. Some feed the widows and the orphans. They all have a different role, and they all live out that purpose. So how do we figure out what it is. It's tough because we don't actually generally hear God's voice saying to us, Brian, this is your role. You have to go do this. We don't actually hear that voice very often. In fact, I've never actually heard God physically speak to me out of the blue and say, this is what I want you to do. And it's interesting because when you look at the book of Acts, other than Paul, Nobody actually hears God's voice booming out of the sky saying, go and do this. Peter hears from God, but he hears from God through a dream, not a voice coming from the sky. And others don't hear from God, but yet they each figure out what their purpose is in the kingdom. So how do we do that? To figure that out, we're going to bounce back and forth between Acts and some Old Testament stories. Starting in 1 Samuel, one of my favorite stories. Samuel is a young man who will grow up to be one of the greatest priests and prophets and judges. But as a young man, he's living in the temple with Eli, the priest. And in those days, at the end of the day, the last thing the priest would do is read the scripture of the night. And then everyone in the household, in the temple, in the temple household, would go to bed meditating on that scripture. Eli's eyes are beginning to grow dim. So odds are, Samuel had helped him read that scripture. Samuel lays down, contemplating that scripture. And he lays down where? Inside the temple, near where the ark is. He lays down in God's presence. A little while later, after laying down, he's falling asleep, and all of a sudden he hears a voice, Samuel, Samuel. So he does what you'd normally expect. He jumps up, runs to Eli's room, and says, Eli, you called. What do you need? I said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel goes and lays back down in bed. A few moments later, he hears a voice again. Samuel, Samuel. He jumps up, runs to Eli's room, says, 
Eli, what do you need? I heard you calling. And I says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So he goes back to bed and lays back down. And the third time he hears, Samuel, Samuel. I think, what on earth is Eli doing? He jumps back up, runs back, and Eli says, Eli, I'm here. What did you need? I heard you calling. And I says, I didn't call you. But wait, something's going on. I think this is God calling. The next time you hear a voice say, Lord, your servant Samuel is here. Speak. We go back to that. And the fourth time God calls him, he runs and he hears. Now there's some important lessons we can find in here for how we listen to the Holy Spirit. First of all, this was also a time in Israel's history when God's voice wasn't often heard, much like now. But Samuel was doing what right before God started speaking to him? He was meditating on God's word. So the first step, if we're going to figure out what God wants us to do, is we need to be immersed in his scriptures. Because God's scriptures are complete and perfect with everything we need for how to know God and how to live for God. Everything we need to know for how to live for God and who God is is contained in there. And we also need to be deep in prayer. And the Bible actually mentions when Samuel's lying down, he was lying down in a place of prayer. Because scripture is how we know God. And prayer is how we speak to God. Prayer is our conversation with God. Now think about your best friends, people who you're closest with. You probably talk to them regularly, right? Yes? Okay. Now, think about people who used to be your best friends years ago, who you don't speak to anymore. Haven't talked to them in a decade or more. Are they still your best friend? Probably not. You probably don't even really know what's going on in their lives unless you happen to see them on Facebook. And if we want to hear from God, the first step is being close to God through the study of the scripture and a deep, meaningful prayer life. If your prayer life is not deep and meaningful, I'd encourage you to come to our Wednesday night prayer group as we study all kinds of different forms of prayer and try all kinds of prayer forms. There's more than one way to pray, as this group will tell you that. Well, after that, he hears God how many times? Four. Four times. The first three times he hears God, he has no clue it's God. He thinks it's Samuel. So understand that a lot of times God is going to have to call you once, twice, three times, four times, or more before you figure it out. If God is calling you to a purpose frequently, when you begin to figure it out, you're going to look back and you're going to see that God has actually been nudging you or calling you to this purpose for a while. He's been equipping you for this purpose because we frequently don't figure it out on God's first time. And we see that with Samuel. It takes him three times. Then, how does he figure it out? Does he do it all by himself? No. He figures it out through the help of Eli, through an older, more mature God follower. In the Methodist church, when I decided I wanted to go into ministry, when I felt God was calling me to ministry, my first step is I go before the SPR, the Staff Parish Relations Committee at my home church, First, First Methodist of Gainesville, and then we go before the charge conference. Because these are the people who know me best. So these are the people who could say, ah, come on now. You're not being called into ministry. We know you better than that. Think again. Or they could say, Adam, it's about time you woke up. We've been seeing this calling in your life for a year now. We <coughs> rely upon other Christians to talk, to discern, to help us Make sure that when we think we're hearing God, that's really who we're hearing. And we see that when we jump to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, the disciples are people of prayer and scripture. In fact, virtually every time that we see the disciples going anywhere, they begin with scripture. When Paul goes into a, to a synagogue to talk, he speaks using scripture. When the disciples pour out of the the upper room after the Holy Spirit descends upon them. Peter begins quoting Isaiah. Scripture is crucial. 
Prayer is crucial, but also gathering together. Before any of the disciples set out on major decisions or major changes, they meet together in councils, in conferences, in discussions. Conference them together so that they can help each other discern where God is calling them. And then they have to be open to the possibility God is leading them somewhere they don't expect. We too often go through life with these little blinders on, and we just we have our direction and our way, and we think we know what we're supposed to be doing, and God is calling us to something completely different. We see that with Peter, suddenly deciding that we don't need to be kosher anymore, because the Holy Spirit shows him. We see that with, with the council in Jerusalem deciding that, that we don't, that new Christians who are Gentiles don't need to be circumcised or keep kosher or follow a lot of the rules. Because meeting together, they see where God is leading. The other thing is, sometimes we have to look in more than one place to figure out what God wants us to do. We see in the story of Elijah. Elijah goes to listen for God. He goes to this cave. And he's looking for God. Because he's expecting God. And, and there's a huge earthquake. And he's, oh, okay, that's God, that's God. And he runs out into the earthquake and, and can't find God. A little while later, there's, there's a huge windstorm. And, oh, that's God. He runs out into the giant windstorm. And, and he can't find God there. A little while later, a huge fire roars up the mountain. Hopefully he doesn't run out into the fire. But he's, oh, there's God in the fire. And God wasn't there. Then finally, standing in the cave, this little teeny, gentle, almost imperceivable breeze blows by. And there in that still quiet is a little still voice of God that he would have missed if he wasn't deep in relationship with God and paying attention and looking for it. Oftentimes when you feel that God is calling you, when you watch and you see that God is doing something and you jump in to join, you're going to discover after you begin that, no, this really isn't what God's calling me to do. That's fine. To step back and try something else. Because when you try what God is actually calling you to do, you will know. And those around you will confirm, we can't believe how great you're doing. You truly are blessed to do this. God is calling you to do this. We see it throughout Scripture. We know and we hear God. Because when we begin to move with God, fulfilling our purpose, God places things in our lives to help us. Others will confirm it. But we can only know it if we spend time in prayer, in study, in small groups, really helping each other, and then exploring, to follow where God's leading. God has a purpose for each of us because God loves us. God is open to showing us that purpose. All we need to do is truly be open to following wherever He's leading. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.